Last week, we saw how Mark was very heavily influenced by the prophet Isaiah. But this influence goes much further than simply the parallels we saw in the eschatological discourse of chapter 13. This is the start of Mark's gospel uh, that we hear in our gospel reading today. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah. That, though, is not how you'll hear the reading from the Jerusalem Bible or any other translation today. What we tend to see is the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, Son of God, full stop. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, look, I'm going to send my messenger, and so on. In the Greek, there is no punctuation. The, the reader of the Greek text had to be very proficient, very skilled, in order to make sense of what could appear to be nonsense. It is therefore a choice of the translator to place the full stop after Son of God. As Joel Marcus points out um, in his The Way of the Lord, this is completely arbitrary. In many instances, a text such as, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, is a bridge. It goes backwards as well as forwards. And therefore, the translation uh, that I've given with the comma, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ and of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, is perfectly accurate as it would be, and it's very cumbersome in the, in the English, to say the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ and of God as it is written in the prophet Isaiah. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, look, I'm going to send my messenger. Though actually, that text is not from Isaiah. It's, um, it's a text which combines a little bit of Isaiah with Malachi, who in turn is reflecting uh, a, a text of the book of Exodus. But this is a key to understanding Mark's gospel. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah. What Mark is saying is, stop now, put down this gospel, and go and read the prophet Isaiah, and then come back, and you'll understand what I'm saying to you about Jesus Christ, Son of God. In Advent, we get some readings from the book of Isaiah, but there's much more that we need to be able to look at. The good news is crucial. Mark is almost sending us to where we should be looking in the prophet Isaiah, and that's what we've already referred to as second Isaiah, chapters 40 to 55. And it's in this section that we have many references to the good news. It's not explicit in the reading we have today from Isaiah 40, but it's certainly there, a message of consoling my people. Why console? Because God is coming to his people. That is the good news. As we hear in a text that we're all familiar with and, and, and we sing very often, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the one, the messenger, the angel who brings, who announces peace and brings good news, who announces salvation, saying to Zion, your God reigns. What is this good news? It's in that final line, the return of the Lord to Zion. The elite had returned from exile in Babylon and they had restored the walls of the city and rebuilt the temple called by Zerubbabel, a descendant of David. Though when the people who remembered the old temple of Solomon saw the temple of Zerubbabel, they wept. It just wasn't almost what God deserved. And there was a sense that while sacrifice could recontinue in Jerusalem, a sense that God had not really returned to Jerusalem, to Zion. He was still to come. Second, Isaiah announces the coming of God, and Mark is aware that it hasn't really happened. And therefore, he's pointing to the prophecies of Isaiah, the good news is now coming. The good news of the Lord returning to his city, to his mountain, his temple. The Lord is referred to in our readings, and the Lord is clearly a reference to God. There's a balance in uh, in 
in uh, Hebrew poetry. And we hear that God is returning, the way of the Lord is to be established. The sacred name of God, the sacred tetragrammaton, the sacred four letters, were never to be pronounced by unclean human lips. Therefore, when the name of God occurred in scripture, it was leaped over with another word, sometimes Hashem, name, and perhaps more often Adonai, Lord. When the Hebrew is translated into Greek, a version called the Septuagint, due to uh, a legend that 72 um, scribes all came up with the same translation. But when uh, the Greek Septuagint was written, the name Adonai was replaced by Kyrios, Lord. When in the Greek we hear Lord, it could simply mean Sir, it could mean Master, oftentimes according to its context it actually means God. So we're hearing that the Lord God is returning to Zion and suddenly in Mark's Gospel Jesus is standing there. What Mark is saying in this first passage, the opening passage of his Gospel, is that the Lord is indeed coming back to his holy place and the Lord is Jesus. In our second reading today, the question is being asked, why hasn't Jesus returned already? Paul and the other thinkers in the early church and believers hoped for the coming of the Lord within a generation, within their lifetime. And now Paul has died, um, as has Peter in the persecutions of Nero in Rome in the 60s, and the apostolic generation are dying. Why hasn't the Lord come? Well, the answer of Second Peter is that God is being patient. He's allowing more people to be saved by his delay. After all, he points out, one day for the Lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a single day. <laughs> 